So welcome to all people connected and attending this uh, lecture. I am very happy to, to be with you and to have the opportunity to describe the future uh, trends of robotic, minimal invasive surgery, and also some uh, information and details about what we are doing in my group as regards robotic minimal invasive surgery. Uh, I have prepared some slides and videos in order to be my talk less boring. So, uh, okay, this is the outline of my, uh, of my talk today. First of all, I would like to give you some, uh, uh, to spend some words about the evolution of robotic surgery. Then the second point is to describe the trend from external robots to endoluminal robots. Uh, and then to explain the quest for miniaturization, that is a quest that we are seeing now in uh, minimal invasive surgery, and the need to integrate robotics and nanomedicine. And finally, very shortly, some conclusions. So, as regards the evolution of robotic surgery, um, I would like to consider motor surgery as a process of convergence of different technologies. In the left of your slides, you can see a sort of um, list of enabling technologies that were necessary to uh, define and to, to generate the modern surgery. Modern surgery was possible when we uh, obtained the uh, enabling technologies of anesthetics, antiseptics, anticoagulants, antibiotics, analgesics, and so on. And next. And, uh, with another enabling technologies uh, that was quite recent, endoscopic instrumentation, it was possible to see inside the human body, to see through the skin, to see through the bowel, and we assisted to the generation of minimal invasive surgery. And finally, with another enabling technology, next please, imaging and robotics, we assist to the generation of computer-assisted surgery. Uh, next slide, please. Which are the objectives of robotics in surgery? Uh, normally, you need robots, not only in surgery, but in many applications when you need more accurate tasks, more predictable tasks, and when you need repeatability. So basically, when you need quality in a task, you need robotics, because, because robotics means uh, controllability and precision. So, if we, have, uh, if we need this quality in many different tasks, many different jobs, why not require the same um, quality also in surgery that is so important for the, uh, for the health of people? Next please. So, as regards robotic surgery, I'd like to describe very, uh, very, very shortly two success stories. The two most successful surgical robots so far can be considered the Da Vinci teleoperative system and the CyberKnife, that is an autonomous system for radiotherapy. Uh, there are also other types of robots used in surgery, for example, assistant robots for camera holding, but I think that Da Vinci and CyberKnife are the most important example of robotics in the surgical room. Next please. As regards Da Vinci, I think that all of you uh, already know this robot. This is a teleoperated robot developed by Intuitive Surgical in California. And uh, uh, in this robotic system, the, the surgeon is operating uh, by a console, and uh, the patient is operated by the, the robot that is very, very nice in terms of mechanical uh, design. The main reason for success of Da Vinci is that this is very, very accurate, very, very precise. Basically, we can say that it's a robot for minimal invasive surgery, even if there are some limitations because you, you can see from the picture that the robot is really large and it requires many different access to the human body. The control is intuitive and the risk of the robot is very uh, similar to the human wrist. So it's possible to make suturing. That is extremely important during surgery. Next, please. 
The second example is the cyber knife. In this case, the robot is not teleported. The robot is a sort of autonomous robot. And uh, this is very similar to the robots that are used in uh, automation, in industrial automation. It's a robot with a very uh, high accuracy. Consider that the robotic targeting precision is less than 200 microns. The overall precision of the treatment, that is X-ray tumor ablation, is less than one millimeter for cranial and spinal lesion. And it's also possible to make uh, the therapy by um, uh, tracking also the respiratory uh, motion. And with a respiratory tracking, we have a precision of 1.5 millimeter. That is extremely good. And this is possible thanks to the robotic design. Next, please. So, yes, uh, robotics and nanomedicine. So the question now is, uh, okay, there is the Da Vinci robot, there is the CyberKnife robot, they are very precise, but also very expensive and very large. The question now is, could we exploit the characteristics and performances of robotics technologies in terms of accuracy, repeatability, speed, computer control, etc., to obtain similar advantages for therapy at millimetric and micrometric scale? So this is the question that is a sort of uh, red line of our presentation. And let's go to the second point of my presentation, from external large robots to teeny and aluminum robots. Next, please. Um, this is a, 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 um, a, the picture of Sir Alfred Kuskeri. Sir Alfred Kuskeri is a surgeon and is a pioneer of minimal invasive surgery. And he normally says that the operating room in the year 2030 will be a totally different environment than today. Why? Because mass screening and early diagnosis will have a major impact on the type and invasiveness of required surgical procedure. So the idea is that we have many, many different enabling technologies for discovering pathologies at an early stage. So if we, we are able to discover a pathology when we have a few cells affected by this pathology, we need also a therapeutic solution that can be minimally invasive and acceptable. So the combination of micro nanotechnologies, chemistry, physics, and micro robotics will be one of the key technologies enabling future high quality early and minimally invasive surgery. So this is the link between robotics and micro or nano robotics for surgery. And the link is motivated by the possibility nowadays to have a very early diagnosis. Next please. So when I uh, uh, discuss about endoluminal therapy and surgery, what uh, do I mean? Endoluminal procedures consist in bringing a set of advanced therapeutic and surgical tools to the area of interest by navigating in the lumen of the human body. And the lumen of the human body are the GI tract, the urinary apparatus, the circulatory system, and so on. You can see in this slide some uh, example of instrumentation already available uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to allow for uh, endoluminal investigation, so uh, endoscopic peel or endoscopic instrumentation for natural orifice transgastric surgery, clip for endoscopic surgery, and so on. Next, please. Uh, I'd like to explain a little bit when our experience in the field started. Uh, next, please. We uh, started with the problem of a painless colonoscopy. Maybe you know that colonoscopy is required uh, as a screening for the cancer of the colon, but colonoscopy is very painful because the problem is that the, 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 the colonoscopic system is difficult to be inserted, it produces pains, it, uh, it needs insufflation. Next, please. So, the idea was uh, why not? using a different locomotion system for the chronoscopic device, not a system that has to be pushed, but a system that can have a self-propulsion, like a worm in the gut. Next please. Then we uh, uh, 
uh, investigated this approach, so the possibility to transform a, a quite rigid colonoscopic device into a sort of a worm-like system for investigation of the colon. Next please. And we uh, developed a sort of intron-like endoscopic device that is now produced by a spin-off company of Scuola Sant'Anna in Dotix. And uh, that is very, very interesting in terms of pain because the system is quite slow, but the, the investigation is complete and this is totally painless. So this is the origin of our story as regards endoluminal endoscopic device. Next please. Then, starting from this experience, we uh, passed from wired pilot colonoscopy to wireless GI endoscopy. Next. Another one, so from the endoscope to a peel with ability of cell propulsion, next please, in order to investigate not only the colon but all the GI tract from the mouth to the arms. Next please. And this is the field of wireless capsule endoscopy. Uh, in this uh, slide you can find many different companies and research groups developing endoscopic peels for the analysis of the GI tract. The majority of these pills are basically um, a passive imaging sensor with telemetry, just able to take pictures along the GI tract. Inside the pills uh, developed by many companies and given, given imaging uh, as the first producer, there is a um, CMOS camera as the camera integrated in your mobile. But these systems are not system for diagnosis because they are passive, they are not controllable from outside. Next